This episode and others like it are made possible by the generous support of my patrons on Patreon. YouTube has demonetized almost all of my recent videos, so if you're able, please consider supporting this channel by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash second thought. This is going to be one of the watershed days in financial markets history. It was a manic Monday in the financial markets. The Dow tumbled more than 500 points after two pillars of the street tumbled over the weekend. Lehman Brothers, a 158-year-old firm, filed for bankruptcy. Brought down by bad mortgage investments, Lehman, which has 25,000 employees, will be liquidated. Merrill, the country's biggest brokerage with 60,000 employees, had been battered by nearly $50 billion in mortgage-related losses. The American people can remain confident in the soundness and the resilience of our financial system. Some people say this this doesn't stop until the housing housing hits bottom. You think that's true? I, I think that's probably correct. This could be the most serious recession in decades. And that means life, as most Americans know it, is about to change. Holy cow, things are going to be much worse than anyone anticipates. The defaults right now are, are incredibly high at unprecedented levels, and there's no evidence that the default rate is tapering off. Those defaults almost inevitably are leading to foreclosures and homes being auctioned and home prices continuing to fall. The Great Recession, the period of economic turmoil following the crash of 2008, is one of those times that feels like it was just yesterday and a million years ago at the same time. Along with 9-11 and the beginning of the Iraq War, the Great Recession remains one of the formative events of my generation's time on Earth. Many of us watched our parents struggle to pay the bills. Countless others lost their homes. After the dust had settled, 10 million Americans had been evicted or otherwise lost their homes in the years following the crash. Some were able to find their footing again, but many never recovered from the financial ruin they suffered 12 years ago. Now, in the midst of another world-altering event, we face a new looming economic crisis. In this episode, we're going to look at the projections for evictions and homelessness in the near future. In the five years after the financial crash, foreclosures and evictions displaced over 10 million people. That's more people than the entire population of the state of Michigan, the 10th most populous state in the country. Apartments, suburban homes, trailers, ranches. Nowhere was safe for the Americans drowning in debt. Those who found themselves without a home came from all sorts of backgrounds and from all walks of life. The crisis displaced young and old alike, and those beyond working age were simply out of luck. They wouldn't have the time to rebuild their lost livelihoods. Some of these evictions were calm. Others were conducted by police officers with guns drawn people's personal belongings being thrown out into the streets. While people of all races were affected, minority communities were the hardest hit. According to a 2012 report by the National Fair Housing Alliance, minority communities had been aggressively targeted for years by loan officers offering the worst of the worst subprime loans, often being awarded a bounty for each minority borrower they secured. The National Fair Housing Alliance reported that the resulting crash represented the largest loss of wealth for these communities in modern history. As a result of being illegally targeted for dangerous subprime loans, the white-black wealth gap ballooned to a shocking 20 to 1 ratio. In retrospect, the whole thing was a disaster waiting to happen, not to mention unethical in the extreme. Banks peddled toxic mortgages across the country, and when they imploded, those same banks simply evicted the borrowers and that was that. Average Americans suffered while the rich and criminal bankers got off scot-free. To make matters worse, the repossessed homes were then snapped up by wealthy individuals and corporations as investment properties, further reducing the already limited supply of reasonably priced housing. One company, Blackstone, spent four and a half billion dollars scooping up over 30,000 homes after their owners had been evicted, and those homes are now netting them a healthy profit as they're held captive on the rental market. The Great Recession was the largest redistribution of wealth in recent memory, and as usual, the rich got richer and everybody else got poorer. But the Great Recession is about to look like a pleasant memory. As the pandemic crisis worsened and people began losing their jobs at an unprecedented rate, a few tiny concessions were forced through the government. Some people got a one-time $1,200 check, which covered maybe one month of expenses, and a patchwork moratorium on evictions was established in some states. This gave the millions of Americans living on the razor's edge a small respite from looming disaster. But as people begin to realize that we're never getting a second check, and unemployment benefits are set to run out just as eviction moratoriums are lifted, the general populace is rightly terrified. According to current projections, of the 110 million Americans currently living in rental properties, at least 20% of them are at risk of eviction. Remember, the foreclosure crisis of 2008 displaced 10 million people over a period of years. COVID, and the horrific American response, is expected to displace between 20 and 28 million people between now and September. 
two to three times as many people as during the Great Recession and in months instead of years. And that's not even taking into consideration the people who own homes. The financial crash of 2008 ruined both renters and homeowners, and we have no reason to assume the COVID crash will be any different. But let's talk for a moment about the situation we face. There is currently a global pandemic ravaging the world. The US has done the worst job by far of containing it, to the point where the very existence of the disease is considered a political opinion and our politicians blatantly disregard safety regulations. Over 40 million people have lost their jobs, and by extension, their health care. Now, the solution to curbing the spread of this disease is to shelter in place. Just stay home. It would stand to reason that if we want people to stay home, it would seem a rather poor decision to forcefully remove 28 million of them from their homes. But that's exactly what's going to happen. So, not only will these people be at a greatly heightened risk of contracting the virus, they'll also have to contend with the mental and physical strain of becoming homeless. Studies have shown that being evicted from your home causes increased mortality rates and respiratory distress, which is just perfect considering that COVID is a respiratory illness. But how did the situation get so bad, and is there anything we can do to fix it? The overarching problem is the militant incompetence of American leadership. Whether they truly believed we were safe from the disease or they didn't want to upset the all-powerful market, the outcome was the same. Regarding the eviction crisis specifically, the main issue is that the federal government has refused to issue a mandate halting all evictions for the duration of the pandemic. Any eviction moratorium measures have been left to the state and local levels, and that has resulted in a confusing patchwork of exemptions, so most people are unsure whether they're living in a complex that could evict them. As of right now, 29 states offer no state-level assurances that renters will not be evicted. Even in the places that do offer assurances, they are not offered with financial assistance, which means that those people who can't pay their rent, even if they're not allowed to be evicted right now, are still going deeper and deeper into debt and will likely be kicked out as soon as the eviction restrictions are lifted. There's plenty of evidence to support this suspicion because, in some states, landlords are allowed to go through the entire eviction process, court hearing and all, and are only stalled at the execution stage. That means there's a whole mountain of eviction orders just waiting to be pushed through the moment they're able. But wait, how are these landlords allowed to evict their tenants without a court hearing? That's part of the problem. As with just about everything else, COVID has made court appearances much more difficult. In the great before times, when we could go out and do things, if your landlord wanted to evict you, you could appear in court and contest it. Now, with courts closed due to pandemic restrictions, these hearings have to take place online. Let's take a hypothetical situation here. If you're at the point of facing eviction, it would be safe to assume you've lost your job, right? If someone is in such dire straits that they're having to choose between food and rent, do you think this person is able to spend money to keep the Wi-Fi on to appear in digital court? And that's not even taking into consideration the elderly people facing eviction who may not understand how to dial into a digital hearing, or those people who are given a broken link, or whose email is spelled incorrectly so they never get the summons. Whatever the reason, if the renter fails to appear for their hearing, that's it. The judge will rule in favor of the landlord. So, 28 million people can't pay rent because they lost their jobs, they lost their health insurance because it's tied to their employment, and now they'll be thrown into the street where they will likely contract COVID and become yet another vector for the disease, further worsening the situation in the US. The American response to the pandemic has been so laughably bad that if it were a movie, no one would believe it. It's like our leaders are doing everything in their power to make the situation as bad as possible. If we're being honest, we cannot reasonably expect these people to suddenly figure it out and start implementing common sense solutions. But on the off chance that they're watching YouTube videos to get some ideas, here are some proposals. First and foremost, we need a federally mandated moratorium on evictions and foreclosures. No one should be at risk of losing their home in the middle of a pandemic. Scrap all the pending eviction orders and forgive past due rent. Second, we need a rent and mortgage freeze for the remainder of the pandemic. If we want people to stay at home, that means they can't work. And if they can't work, they can't make rent or mortgage payments. Next, we need a real nationwide lockdown. I drove past a water park the other day and there were lines everywhere. Shut that down. No bars, no gyms, no public gatherings of any sort. Shut everything down for at least two months. Continue testing. Listen to the medical community and the leaders of nations who beat their outbreak. Finally, and this is the really critical part, and the part that will guarantee none of this will happen, the federal government needs to pay people to stay home. People still have expenses. They need to eat. They need their medications. The entire incentive to reopen the economy is so that businesses can keep making money and workers can get their paychecks. If we take that out of the equation, the need to reopen the country is greatly diminished. There are proposals on the table from people like Bernie Sanders who suggest $2,000 per person per month for the remainder of the pandemic. 
For some people, this will be more than they normally make. For others, it'll be less. But if rent and mortgage payments are frozen, then it should be enough money for people to cover their essential expenses. And if you're the type of person to complain if someone is making more than they normally do, when that $2,000 per month would only add up to $24,000 per year, you need to reevaluate your priorities. After the pandemic has finally passed, assuming 2020 doesn't have some other extinction event planned for us, we need to address the housing problem. There's a decided lack of affordable housing in America, in no small part due to the parasitic greed of the corporations who bought up all the homes after 2008. Because of this, there are millions more Americans caught in the incredibly expensive rental market. We have a long way to go to make America the country many Americans think it is, and fair housing practices are a key part of that. I mentioned at the beginning of this video that this kind of content is supported by my patrons on Patreon. This type of video, while very important, is something that sponsors won't touch. In order to pay the bills and keep this channel running, I rely on AdSense revenue, sponsors, and donations from generous viewers. By producing explicitly anti-capitalist content, I lose out on both sponsors and AdSense. If you enjoy the kind of videos I'm producing, and you're able to chip in even a dollar a month, I would greatly appreciate the support. You can find my Patreon page at patreon.com slash secondthought. Every tier comes with Discord benefits for our new and growing Discord server. You can check out my previous episodes by clicking the links on your screen. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.